Now I'm joined by uh, Larry Kaufman. Uh, okay. And Larry, what's your background? My background is service and support. Joined to launch the Stylus Pro 9000 and set up the support organization for uh, that initial LFP and all the future ones that uh, have followed. But you really, you were kind of like the last line of, of uh, tech support uh, defense. Absolutely. Yeah. I've, I've heard it all over the last nine years. There are some things that are kind of like old wives' tales, misconceptions, or downright falsehoods. You know, when you buy Epson ink, it comes with an expiration date. Uh, does ink have a shelf life? And particularly now with the, the 900 series, you've got 700 mil uh, cartridges. Can you keep those in the printer for six months? And is that a problem? No, six months is no problem at all. A year is, is probably no problem. You don't want to buy more ink than you need uh, to run within a reasonable amount of time. So in the 900 class product, we actually have three cartridge sizes. We have a 150, a 350, and a 700 milliliter cartridge. So 700 milliliters times 11 cartridges is a lot of ink. Um, so unless you expected to you know, be in full production mode for quite a bit, I probably would choose a smaller cartridge. So what about agitation? Let's take a new cartridge out of the 900 series, for example. So this is a 350 milliliter cartridge. And when I agitate it, basically it's just going to be a gentle back and forth. That's about all you need to do. Um, don't recommend that you do it that often. You don't want to basically damage uh, the needle valve and you don't want to do it too vigorously um, unless you've got that covered or you, you, know, you might damage the cartridge or the bladder in, inside. So. Well, what about rocking? That'll work. That'll work? Sure. But no. No shaking like I, that? I wouldn't recommend it. Okay. Well, what about when you first put a new cartridge in, the instructions are to agitate it. Is there any, any truth to uh, agitating ink that's been in a, a printer that has been unused for a period of time? Two things you want to be careful of. Um, one is not to agitate it too hard. You don't want to risk damaging the bladder that actually holds the ink. Um, the other thing is you don't want to do it too often. Um, there's a needle valve that has to puncture the cartridge, and by constantly inserting and removing that cartridge, you potentially damage you know, that seal, and air in the cartridge will create havoc. You don't want to do that. Okay. Uh, but if you haven't used the printer for a period of time, say a month, mm -hmm. uh, would that be a, a suggestion to agitate? A month, no. No, okay. No. Three months, maybe. Okay. okay. Why are the cartridges pressurized? Well, that's an easy one. It's physics. <laughs> you know, um, we need to deliver ink on demand to the printhead. And with the cartridges, basically, at a lower level than the printhead, so in the 900 class product, they sit down below in the carriage and are now concealed and covered up. We have to pressurize that ink to get it up to the printhead and provide a consistent flow. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the things uh, a lot of people, when they get their first printer, the charging process right. from... Uh, going from a new printer to fully charged seems to take up so much ink. Uh, is there any ink wasted in that uh, initial charge? And how much is con actually consumed? What we're doing is we're priming all the tubes that are in the printer. They're rather lengthy. In a 44-inch model, those tubes will hold a higher capacity uh, volume of ink than in a 24-inch model. Um, we also have to purge the print head of shipping fluid. So we actually put a, a fluid in the system uh, at the time it leaves manufacturing because we don't know how long it's going to sit um, on the boat as it comes over here in, a, in somebody's warehouse, you know, before it actually gets to a photographer that's going to plug it in and use it. Uh, but that's not, it's charging the line is not wasting the ink, it's ink that will be used. Correct. Yeah. Well, is there a difference uh, now between the 1440 and the 2880 in terms of the print quality? When you go from 1440 to 2880, you change the size of the drop you use and what we call microweave, or the, the interlacing of dots as we're doing multiple passes. So 2880 is just that little bit you know, finer detail in the actual print. But probably not necessary for watercolor or matte papers. No, and on a watercolor and matte paper, you've got to use a term from old pre-press, you've got a lot of dot gain. The dot basically grows a little bit and bleeds and softens. So um, one of the reasons why on a lot of those papers, the 
option for 2880 actually isn't even available in the driver. Mm -hmm. Do you use more ink at 2880 versus 1440? That's a question that always, always strikes me funny. Um, you're still painting the canvas or the print with the, you know, coverage is essentially the same. Um, there is different dot size usings, so the ink will not be exactly the same, but there's really no significant difference in the amount of ink used between those prints. The Epson driver versus a rip. What about rips? Can you get better photographic quality from a rip than from the Epson driver? If you're working on single files, RGB um, to our device, photographic data, then our driver does an amazing job. Where rips really, and we still bundle rips, we do it with Color Burst and various products. Um, where rips come into play is in graphic arts and design. So it handles CMYK data. It handles vector data and font data more accurately than our driver will. It has advanced layout tools. Actually, that line's kind of getting blurred now because Lightroom will do package layout and those types of things for you. But if your sole purpose is to print photography one file at a time, then our driver is second to none. The only time it would really make sense for a photographer to really look at a rip at this point is if they had to do CMYK proofing um, or they were printing out of page layout applications. Correct. Okay. Uh, one of the, the new things in the 900 class, and if you were using a thin paper, the old cutting mechanism seemed to work pretty good, but uh, couldn't really cut canvas, couldn't cut really thick material, but you have a new uh, paper cutting uh, system for the 900 class. Oh, we do? Yeah. It's, it's exciting. So the old technology was basically a blade type system and it rode on the carriage with the print head. Now we're employing a rotary cutter and it's off carriage. So it's moved further down into the printer and we'll cut canvas, we'll cut fine art media, we'll cut just about any roll media you can put through the printer. Um, it's extremely durable and it's extremely fast. It's a single pass cut and on the 44 inch model it's, it cuts with, in less than a second. So the fact that it's a rotary cutter, that means that the blade lasts longer? Blade should be very durable. We, we expect in a lot of cases it'll last for the life of the printer. Even if you're cutting in the, the big heavy stuff? Yep. Cool. Yep, no problem. Uni-D, Bi-D, uh, you know, high speed on, high speed off. Can you kind of do a little decoding for that and explain what uni and by d is and whether or not high speed on or off is uh, suggested? Uni d is one directional. By d is basically two directions. Um, so high speed equates to bidirectional. You're printing in both directions, it's fast. So high speed on is equivalent to by d, high speed off equivalent to uni d. What is spindleless loading, which is one of the new things to make the loading easier for the 900 class? Spindleless loading is a new system to basically put media, roll media, onto your printer. And it's these end caps. So you get a pair of end caps, and it will automatically adjust to a two or three inch core, and you now basically have no long spindle you need to thread through the media. So you just stick one of these on each end, right. lock it into place. Lock it into place, put it on the printer, and you're ready to go. One of the things that is on one of the buttons on the control panel is the E-Platin. What is that? E-Platin um, basically replaces um, something that's been on all of our printers from day one, and that's what we call, at least in tech support, called the press lever. And basically a mechanical lever, and you would open it up, and it would allow you to load your media or unload it. And with e-platin, that's basically a button. So now you, you press the button, the pressure rollers on the platen release, and the take-up system um, will automatically rewind the media for you. One of the nice features of that is, you know, we'll get, especially with fine art media, people will complain that if they leave their uh, media in the printer, they'll get a dent. Mm -hmm. And it's expensive media and it's a waste. So, and they'll forget, you know, to hit the, the old press lever. Well, made it a little bit easier. All you have to do is hit that button at the end of the day, walk off, you're good to go. Well, one of the things in terms of talking about uh, sending data as fast as possible, is there any advantage to uh, USB uh, 2 versus Ethernet? USB 2 is great for a single computer connected to one of our printers. Where we see trouble, at least back to my tech support history, is when you want to place the printer somewhere that's not so close to your computer. 
and daisy chaining or extending the length of USB um, is not a good choice. So in that case, going Ethernet, you can position the printer anywhere you'd like. Both interfaces will keep the printer at full speed. So okay, so one's not faster than the other? Nope. Okay. For the purposes of getting data to our printer, both, both meet that need. What about print length? Print length is an interesting topic. What limits it is actually a combination of our driver, um, the OS that it's running on, and the application um, that you're using. So currently there's some updates coming to you know, typical applications that photographers would use and should solve a lot of those issues. Uh, but what's the maximum dimension that the new printers will print on uh, Mac or PC? On a PC, the, well, you can go in and create a custom page setup that's 590 inches long. So as long as the application will support feeding data, um, do the math, it's, it's a pretty substantial print length. So let's take a look at that print head a little bit more. Uh, uh, this is the new print head and the new printers? TFP print head, thin film piezo. Uh, it's a 10 channel print head. What we actually have is what we call five nozzle plates. So there's one, two, three, four, five nozzle plates. Each nozzle plate contains two colors, and each color has 360 individual nozzles or holes to spit ink out of. And one of the interesting things about TFP is, is when you go through our new color LCD um, and you need, need to do a cleaning, um, you can clean individual nozzle plates at the same time. So instead of cleaning all colors, you can now clean two colors. Okay. So what about the new control panel and the LCD? We talked a little bit about E-Platin, which is basically now a button uh, to release the pressure and, and unload and load media. We've got a black ink switch that you can initiate from the control panel and a color LCD that makes navigating the menu a little easier. So if you already have a uh, maintenance tank from one of the previous printers, do they still work? Absolutely. Same, same part number, same SKU, compatible across the line, no problem. One of the things I got to ask, uh, Epson uh, in the past has been known for pretty good unit to unit variation, but... Um, you mean consistency? Consistency. Uh, well, very low unit to variation. unit variation. Right. Uh, one of the things that kind of made a lot of buzz is when uh, one of the printer manufacturers came out with a built-in spectrophotometer. And now uh, you have an option for the 900 class printers right. to have an onboard spectro. Um, why did it take Epson so long to do that? And what is uh, the spectro's true purpose? Our printers are very consistent. And our and print to print is very consistent. So what really drove the development of the spectro proofer was the commercial proofing environment. And in that environment, um, they want to be able to certify a proof and read values and have a have a workflow tool that's different than required in photography. Are you saying that uh, as a photographer uh, that they may not even need the spectrum? Our, our recommendation right now is absolutely in line with that. The, uh, in photography, we think there's better alternatives out there. Uh, but it's uh, particularly useful for the commercial printing for printer linearization and... In a proofing workflow environment, hence SpectroProofer, um, with print certification and um, constant linearization where they're concerned about lot control for ink, lot control for media, are very precise measuring LAB values on every print, measuring delta E to make sure that a proof that's run in China is consistent with design that was done in the U.S. So, absolutely.